Hey class, welcome back. We just finished our lecture last week on what is the Bible, and now we're jumping into what is the gospel. Now, if you remember last week, I really emphasized that that class and this class may be the most important classes that you take this semester. I would even argue that they could be the most important classes that you take at this college because of the overwhelming problem that we have in our American culture, our American Christianity, where we have lost an understanding of what the Bible is, and we've lost our understanding of what the gospel is. And by the way, the two of those overlap. They relate to one another. You cannot understand the gospel if you don't understand what the Bible is. And you can't understand the Bible unless you understand what the gospel is. And so we have to, in some senses, we have to deconstruct what we may have heard in the past about what the gospel is or what the Bible is. Uh, in my own life, in my own upbringing, um, I, I learned as a child what the Bible was, and I learned what the gospel was. And many aspects of that, they were fine. But many aspects of it, it was missing something. It was a caricature or, or a dumbing down of the full, robust gospel. Now, I'm not even going to pretend to cover everything that I could cover in this class. People have written lengthy books to try to explain what the gospel is. In this class, I'm simply going to try and help you, my students, to understand some misconceptions in our culture and what the, what the gospel is according to the scriptures, according to the Apostle Paul himself, who wrote so much about the gospel. So let's dive in, and I hope this is going to be a real help to you. First of all, you know that I'm the academic advisor here, and so I interview all of our incoming students, which means you. And so often when I ask a young person, what, what is the gospel, I find out that they just have never been taught that. Uh, sometimes I'll get, well, is, is it a genre of music? Or I'll get, well, isn't it one of the four books in the Bible? Or I'll get something to the effect of, uh, if they have gone to church, I'll get something to the effect of, um, well, Jesus died on the cross so that I don't have to go to hell and that I can go to heaven. Uh, some, some version of that. Uh, but the word gospel has really lost its meaning. And so what I want to focus on when we talk about this topic of what is the gospel, first of all, we have to stop and we just have to talk about the word gospel. The word gospel has lost its meaning, and many who understand its meaning have diluted it into what I referred to a second, a second ago, a get-out-of-hell-free card. Um, this monopoly card where, you know, when I, when I get to the end of my life and I get stuck in the bad place, oh, no, I have this card and now I get to go to the good place because I prayed some prayer or I had some experience at a youth conference or whatever the case may be. I don't want to minimize prayers. I don't want to minimize some youth conference experience that you had. But I want to highlight in the scriptures what the gospel is. We have to be clear on what the gospel is. And if we're going to be clear on it, number one, we've got to go to the scriptures. And number two, we've got to debunk some of the misconceptions in our culture that are preaching other gospels. So even those who have understood what the word gospel means oftentimes have been given a version of this good news, which entails some sort of Romans road. Um, we're all sinners. We deserve hell. Jesus died on the cross. If you have faith and believe in Jesus, you can go to heaven. It's, it's not that any of that is necessarily wrong. It's just not what we find in the scriptures when the apostle Paul or, or the, the author of Mark, John Mark, talks about the gospel. So we have to stop and talk about what the scriptures say. I want to give you, to start this class off, 
kind of a, a funny analogy, and it's actually kind of sad, but in some ways it's funny. I want you to imagine my six-year-old daughter, Kara. I come up to Kara and I say, Kara, I want to talk to you about the gospel. Kara looks up at me and she says, okay, daddy. I look down at Kara and I say, all right, Kara, I pick her up and I dangle her over a lake of fire. And I, this is hell and the devil's there. And, of course, this six-year-old brain, I mean, she can't compute all of this. She's terrified. Oh, no, the hot, fiery hell place. And, of course, every person who's ever passed away in Kara's life that she has known um, has gone to the good place, has gone to heaven. Uh, Do you, you ever go to a funeral and they say, well, this person probably went to hell? No, no, no. Uh, it's, always, it's always talked about, pretty much everybody who's ever died, and so... As a little six-year-old mind is turning, they're asking questions about what is the cemetery and where did Aunt Georgina go when she died? And it's all heaven, heaven, heaven. So a six-year-old in their brain, hell is a hot, fiery, terrible place where Satan is. Um, heaven is the golden streets, gates of pearl, cotton candy, ice cream, Aunt Georgina, Grandma and Grandpa, Jesus, Tooth Fairy, Santa Claus. Now, I'm being a little sarcastic, but the point that I want to make is for a six-year-old brain, or in my case, when I was four, when I hear this message, this gospel, oh my gosh, I don't want to go to the fiery place. I want to go to the good place. So I'll do whatever I have to do to go to the good place because I hate fire and I really would rather have cotton candy and ice cream. All right, Kara. If you will pray this prayer and ask Jesus to save you from the hot, fiery place and take you to heaven, you can go to heaven. Oh, okay, I'll say the prayer. Dear, dear Jesus, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. I know I deserve hell. But I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. And this prayer that the little child is repeating after the adult, you get all done with it and you look at the little child and you say, all right, Kara, where are you going to go when you die? Uh, I don't know. Well, you're going to go to heaven because you prayed the prayer. Oh, I'm going to go to heaven because I prayed the prayer. So what is going on in this situation? By the way, I don't want to minimize a child's faith. Um, in my own personal life, I prayed this kind of prayer when I was four years old. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. But with my own children, I actually have four children. And one of my children at the age of six... Because I had explained to them the real gospel that I'm going to explain to you here in a moment, and because her mind was so advanced and developed, as a six-year-old, she decided to do what I'm going to teach we must do to become a child of God. So I don't want to minimize a six-year-old's ability to comprehend the gospel. But the gospel is not, are you ready for it? This. This is not the gospel. There's nowhere in the Bible where you're going to find this on any page. This idea that there's the world, there's a hot, fiery place called hell, and that the cross of Jesus Christ is the way to walk, a, walk over hell and to end up in heaven. That's just not in the Bible. Now, there's certainly... Within the Bible, a lot about heaven, a lot about hell, a lot about the cross, and a lot about how through the cross we can be with God in heaven. So hear me carefully. I'm, I'm not trying to take a picture, which most likely you have seen, and I'm not trying to throw out the baby, throw, throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm trying to get us to go into the text of scripture and say, what did Paul say that the gospel was? That's what I want to aim for us to do in this class. We have to first start off by defining the word gospel. The word gospel in, in the Greek is uh, euangelion, euangelion. Now, euangelion is a very interesting word. It means good news, but it means more than good news. This was not the kind of word that they would use in the Greek when someone had gotten a new horse or a new buggy or whatever they drove back then, they didn't have pickup trucks. But when you and I get a new vehicle, we might say to our friend, hey, I've got good news, right? 
No, the word euangelion was a different word because they had words for, I got a new car or a new truck. This word euangelion was specifically used to to pronounce or or to or to share this big announcement that something had happened for which the world would never be the same uh, the war had been won there's a new king on the throne and he's a better king and everything's going to be better this word euangelion was talking about something that had happened for which the world would never be the same again. And this is the word that Jesus used in the very first verses of the Gospel of Mark. This is the word that Paul uses all throughout his letters to the churches to describe something that had happened for which the world would never be the same. This word, angelion is extremely important. Good news, gospel. I want to open to the book of Romans, and I want to read Paul's words. This is what Paul writes to the church in Rome. The, the church that was full of Jews and non-Jews. The church that was fighting over Jewish laws and whether or not someone had to obey the laws in the Torah, in the Old Testament, to be a Christian. And Paul wants to make it very clear throughout this letter what the gospel is, how we are saved, how we are rescued. It absolutely has to do with you and me, our individual salvation, but we can't minimize it to that. It's so much more. It has to do with the story of the Bible. So hear Paul carefully as he reads, as he writes, this letter is from Paul a slave of Christ Jesus. Now we have to stop right there and ask the question, what does the word Christ Jesus mean? This word Christ in Greek is the word Christos. Now, I don't want to get too technical because this is an early entry level class, but I want to make it clear that the Greek word Christos is the same word as the Hebrew word Messiah. The Old Testament word Messiah, which, which we translate in English as Messiah, is the New Testament word, the Greek word for Christos, which we translate in the English Christ. Here's the point that I want to make to you, and it's a simple point. The word Messiah and the word Christ are the same word. It was the long-awaited leader. That, the, that God's people for thousands of years, since the promise to Abraham in Genesis 12, it was the long-awaited leader who would come and who would restore the world. He was not just going to be a savior. He was going to be, as we'll see here in a few verses, he was going to be the Lord and the King and the ruler. So listen, let's continue on. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his euangelion, euangelion, his good news. God promised this euangelion, God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this gospel was something that was promised long ago through the prophets. This good news is about his son. It's all about Jesus. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. Now why, and this is an important note, if you have your Bible open to Romans chapter 1, I want you to underline David's royal family, King David's family line. Why does Paul, when he's explaining the good news, talk about David's royal line. I thought we're talking about heaven and hell and how I can go to the good place, how I don't have to burn in hell. And Paul's over here explaining the gospel in his own words, and he's talking about David's line. 
in, uh, in Paul, Paul later on, as he writes to Timothy, one of his young, young men that he's training, this is exactly what Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.8, and it mirrors what he says here to the church in Rome. He says to Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Paul in Romans 1, is telling the church that he has been commissioned to spread the good news. What is the good news? Euangelion. It's an announcement by which the world will never be the same. And he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he tells the church in Rome, that Jesus not only came, died on the cross, was buried, rose from the grave, but that he's from the line of David. Now, why is that important? It's so important because Jesus Christ was not just dying on the cross to save sin, save sinners, which he was. He was dying on the cross and his death, burial, and resurrection was his enthronement. He ascended to the throne in heaven just like the prophet Daniel talked about all those years before. Daniel chapter 7, the prophetic, the prophetic chapter of Scripture, which talks about the Son of Man ascending to the Ancient of Days, sitting on the throne and being given dominion to rule over all the all of the uh, do, all of the domain, all of the the rulers of this world, all of the kingdoms of this world. He's the King of Kings. He would ascend to the throne. We see this in Psalm chapter two, and he is going to be given rulership over all the nations. This is what Paul is talking about in his gospel. His announcement is that Jesus has died, was buried arose, ascended, and is on the throne. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles, non-Jews, everywhere, what God has done for them so they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Later on, just a few verses later, this is what Paul says. Now, now listen to this in light of the fact that Jesus is king. In light of the fact that Paul is telling us that Jesus Christ was from the line of David, and that he's ruling as king. Jesus Christ commissioned Paul and the other apostles to go into the Roman Empire and to announce the euangelion that Jesus is king, right? Now, what would that have looked like? What would it have looked like for Paul and his apostles to go throughout the Roman Empire and say that Jesus is king? It would have been foolish. It would have been crazy. People would have looked at Paul and said, what are you talking about? Caesar is king. Caesar is Lord. Who is this Jesus? Some guy who was a, a, some sort of prophet and led some revolution and the Roman Empire had to kill him. And now you're saying he arose from the grave and he's king? What? So, in one sense, we can look at this from an apologetic standpoint. Who in their right mind would have traveled around the known world at the time with the risk of death by blaspheming the emperor of Rome to preach that Jesus is king? Who would have done that? But also, let's look at it from the standpoint that what Paul was doing is he was calling on these people to realize it's not Caesar who's king. It's Jesus who's king. And he says in verse 16 of Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of this euangelion. I'm not ashamed of this good news about Christ. 
It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and the Gentile. This euangelion tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Now, in the next lecture, we're going to talk about faith and repentance and baptism. And faith is one of those words like gospel that in our American culture doesn't mean what it meant here. We'll talk about that in the next lecture. But what I really want to emphasize to you in this class is that the good news, the euangelion, was an announcement for which the world would never be the same. And it wasn't just that Jesus died on the cross, was buried and rose again so we could go to heaven. It was the announcement that Jesus was king. Now that's important for the next class. Because when we start talking about Jesus as king, we're talking about Jesus as savior. Yes, he is, he is the savior of the world. But he's also the king. So a savior is one who should be adored, who should be loved, who should be trusted. But a king is someone for which we give our allegiance. All of our allegiance goes and belongs to him. A king is someone who, if you're the enemy, you lay down your arms and surrender to him. Wow. And when Paul starts talking in Colossians about how you and I were the enemies of God. That whole word surrender takes on a different meaning, doesn't it? Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ is our Creator. We learned that when we talked about Jesus Christ in Colossians 1, who was there at the beginning. So he's our Savior. He's our Creator. He's the one who formed you in your mother's womb. And he is our king. He's our Lord. He's our master. He's our ruler. And we will bow the knee to him one day. And hopefully for you in my class, you are bowing the knee to him right now. You're surrendering your life to him. I want to give you an incredible explanation on what the gospel is from one of my favorite theologians, N.T. Wright. Would you read this with me? The gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news that in Jesus and through his death and resurrection, the God who made the world has redeemed the world and through his spirit, he is redeeming the world. And one day he will finally redeem the world from all that corrupts and, enslave, and enslaves it making the new heavens and new earth which he has promised. In other words, the gospel is the crucified and risen Jesus is Lord of the world and hallelujah. That is the euangelion that Paul announced. Jesus Christ has come, the long-awaited Messiah. He has overcome death. He has overcome sin. He has overcome the grave. He has been enthroned. He's on the throne ruling. And he's Lord of the world. And hallelujah. This is the good news. This is the gospel. That Jesus Christ is now on the throne. Now, how is that good news for you and me? Well, let's let N.T. Wright answer that question. God is in the process of putting the world right, and he is now recruiting by his Spirit, through the proclamation of Jesus, people who will join in this project, where they have to be put right themselves in order to be part of God's putting right movement for the world. And this obviously involves believing. It involves joining and being plunged into the family of Jesus' followers. And it involves then Inevitably, inevitably, having one's life turned upside down, inside out, by the Holy Spirit working in someone's life. The announcement 
that the crucified Jesus is Lord of the world has the power right there to stop people in their tracks, to make them go hot and cold all over, and to sense a strange love and power come upon them and transform them. Some people sneer and scoff, but that message transforms lives. I want to end this class with a story. And this is a story that you've already read in the first chapter of Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart by J.D. Greer. J.D. Greer tells the story about one once upon a time in college, he wanted to go out and he wanted to share the gospel with some, with some people. And so he went to a basketball court and he, he started a pickup game. And as he began to play, uh, he was pretty good at basketball and he's playing against these other guys. And he says to them, if I beat you in basketball, you have to listen to me talk, talk for a few minutes about heaven and hell. And of course, he was wanting to beat them and then get the opportunity to share the good news about Jesus. The guy he was playing across from, he explains it in the book, but this guy was a rough guy. Uh, he was swearing left and right and, and just a vulgar, crude person that really, from just his own, uh, his own mouth, you could tell that he didn't have too much interest in God. This man, this young man looked across at J.D. Greer uh, holding the basketball and said to him, Are you going to try to witness to me? And J.D. Greer said, Well, yeah, I, I was. And this, this, uh, this, this man looks across at J.D. Greer and says, Well, listen here. He said, First of all, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in your God. But second of all, when I was a young boy, I went to vacation Bible school and I prayed that prayer and I asked Jesus to save me. So you believe in eternal security, don't you? You believe once you're saved, you're always saved, don't you? J.D. Greer said, well, yeah. He said, well, good. I don't believe in your God, but if your God's real, I'm going to heaven because I prayed that prayer. Now that story is a perfect example of how many people in America view the gospel. They view it as something I did back then, a prayer I prayed, a decision I made. And let's be clear, for you to be part of God's family it, it requires a decision that you must make. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. But the good news is that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. He really was the Messiah. He was the one, the long-awaited leader that they had been waiting for. When Jesus died on the cross, the, 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 the morning after Jesus' death on the cross, all of Jesus' followers thought to themselves, we picked the wrong guy. He wasn't the Messiah. We thought he was. And Jesus on the road to Emmaus, as we talked about in the last lecture, he showed these two men all throughout the scriptures, the writings and the prophets, I am the Messiah. And now Paul goes around the known world and he preaches this euangelion. Jesus is king. He's from the line of David. He's ruling and he demands your allegiance. You're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose between Caesar and Jesus. It's quite that simple. Now, when we put the gospel in that light, and when we look at these people in the Roman Empire who had to choose between Caesar and Jesus, and by the way, when they chose Jesus, many of them went under heavy persecution. Many of them were thrown in prison, and many of them died because they gave their allegiance to Jesus Christ. But I'm getting ahead of myself, and that's for the next lecture. God bless you, students.